Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, just bad news. Someday good news, but not today. Uh, deadlines, same as they were before, unchanged. Quiz and assignments, part one. Deadline of five, September 18th. Exam one, quiz and assignments, part two. Deadline of five, October 16th. Exam two, quiz and assignments, part three. Deadline of five, November 13th. Exam three, four, quiz and assignments, part four. Deadline December 4th. And final December 11th at noon. For the paper, uh, deadlines are for the draft if you want to do one. Deadlines are November 16th. The plus five bonus deadline, November 18th. Full credit deadline, November 25th. And half December 4th. And again, all of the uh, uh, tests and quizzes are on Blackboard. And the paper is turned into Blackboard with the exception of the draft, which is printed and you know, given to me, and I mark it up. Before pressing on to the new stuff, any stuff about the previous stuff, the syllabus stuff, the stuff stuff, needs more stuff. What is the next assignment? What is the next assignment? Oh, the next thing to do? Yes. Uh, there'd be the deadlines of the most proximal, closest deadlines would be the uh, quizzes for part one. Oh, sorry, no assignments. Um, just quizzes. Uh, quizzes are part one, deadline of filing September 18th, so that's the closest thing. Okay. okay, anything else? Okay, so now we turn to some actual ethics content. Now, a good starting question is, of course, what is ethics and morality? Well, the answer, you know, put kind of in bumper sticker terms is this. Ethics, morality, is about good and evil and all that stuff. Being a little more specific, here's a little more detail. Moral philosophy slash ethics is the study, the rational investigation of issues relating to you know, good and evil, right and wrong. Probably the best way to sort of present it is to look at it in terms of a branch of philosophy and what sort of problems it tries to address, and what sort of questions it tries to answer. Now, when looking at ethics, we can break it down into various levels of you know, abstraction. Now, one way to look at morality or ethics is this. It's what's called descriptive ethics or morality. And the idea there is to simply describe the values, the morals, the ethics of particular cultures, people, at particular times and places. This is the sort of thing that's done in anthropology, sociology, psychology, history. And so an example of descriptive ethics would be something like if one is talking about the moral views of, say, the ancient Greeks, or talking about the sexual morality prevalent in 1950s America. And that would be descriptive ethics. It's simply saying these people at this time had these expressed beliefs about what is wrong and is right. Now that stuff is clearly important because you don't want to just make stuff up when doing philosophy, as always it may sound. But if we just stuck with descriptive ethics, we'd be doing sociology, psychology, anthropology, etc. We wouldn't be doing philosophy. So what is moral philosophy and ethics, what does that involve? Well, to answer that, we have to kind of break stuff down, again, to levels of abstraction, looking at you know, some of the questions and problems. At the most extreme level of abstraction is what's called meta-ethics. The idea is this. Meta-ethical questions deal with the most abstract, the least concrete questions, sort of the highest level. And these would include questions like this. What is good? What is evil? Not in terms of particular things that are good or evil, but in terms of evil itself. What is the nature of evil? What is the nature of good? Another uh, question on meta level would be something like this. Is good and evil morality ethics, is it subjective or objective? 
is in the eye of the beholder, or is it a feature of reality? And so the meta-ethics deals with those most abstract questions and problems. And again, probably the, the two biggest ones are what is good and what is evil. Now, moving down to being a little bit more concrete, we go down to what's called normative ethics. This is a level that's more concrete than meta. This involves developing the principles, rules, etc., that are then applied to particular cases. So, to use a concrete example, in normative ethics, we work out our sort of general principles and standards. We might work out a principle that lying in general is wrong, or killing is wrong. And so this is still kind of general, because we're dealing with you know, broad principles or rules, etc. But it's more concrete, bless you, than meta-ethics. Now the most concrete level is applied ethics. As the name implies, this is taking our principles, standards, rules from our normative ethics and applying them to particular concrete cases. For example, let's take, a, let's take an example that illustrates it all the way down. At the meta-ethical level, again, the question is like, what is good, what is evil? And we may also look at the question of what is the basis of morality? One answer commonly given by people is, not surprisingly, as we'll see, a religious answer. So some of them might answer the meta-ethical question, what is the basis of morality, with the answer, God. Or, as we'll see in part two, something else. At the normative level, that's working out you know, the principles, the rules, etc. And so you might have, for example, take one of the standard rules in religious-based ethics, uh, killing, uh, no, <laughs> none of that stuff. Then when it comes to applied ethics, we would take our principles or rules and apply them to a particular case. For example, we might apply them to the issue of capital punishment. We might say, well, if God is a basis of ethics, that ethical, and if one of our principles is, you know, don't kill him, then we might say in the particular case of capital punishment, that would be wrong, for example. So one way to sort of look at ethics is in regards to those levels of you know, abstraction. The really theoretical stuff, a bit more concrete, principles, rules, etc., and then the application. To use a crappy analogy to illustrate it, think of the way kind of like um, law kind of works. This would be sort of like the theory of law. You know, what is the theory behind law? And there's different views, and we'll see, well, actually we'll, we'll talk about some of these. Some who believe, for example, that law is just totally make up. Made up. We just make that crap up, you know, totally human constructed. Other people believe that law comes from divine source. Other people believe it comes from the laws of nature. At the normative level, these would be like the law books, you know, all the rules we've got, you know, all things that are put into law. And then the applied version would be, you know, like in courts or what the police do, taking the actual laws and applying them. And so that's kind of an analogy that illustrates a level of ethics. Now, what are some classic moral problems that people try to deal with? Well, I mentioned some of them already. Capital punishment, classic. Other classic ones include, well, you know, killing. Now, when you think of like ethical problems, problems that are trying to, people are trying to deal with good or evil, what are some other examples? What are, when you think of like good and evil, what do you think of? Anyone? Anyone? You were? Abortions? Yeah, abortion. Classic one. It's been, a, you know, when I was an undergrad thousands of years ago, it was a point of debate. They have everyone wrote papers on it. Um, still issue today. On the death penalty? The death penalty? Yeah, death penalty. Classic one. You know, to be killing people or not killing people. Never going to kill them. And there's also sub issues. For example, one thing that, that's happened is they've 
had trouble getting the uh, drugs to kill people, you know, the pharmaceuticals. Because I don't really like design to kill people, they just kind of do that. And so there's some issue about how should we be killing people. Lethal injection, poison gas, you know, shooting them, um, you know, steamroller, rabbit ferrets, you know, all viable options. Any other moral issues that come up today? Well, interestingly, you could take just about anything and make it into a moral issue. For example, uh, you could take uh, performance-based funding for universities. It's a moral issue. Is that something morally right or morally wrong? You can take um, issues dealing with the police, you know, the way policing is done, the use of force, morally acceptable and morally not acceptable. You can take the criminal justice system. Yeah, for one thing that has come to the attention of people recently is policing as revenue, where the idea is not to protect the community so much as to bring revenue for the city or county, which raises, of course, a moral issue. Technology raises a multitude of moral issues. You know, one we had mentioned before was self-driving automobiles. They have to decide who they're going to kill. And so they're working on ethics for that. In terms of, you know, machines designed to kill, the way that you're looking for, you know, a career or investments, autonomous weapons are supposed to be the wave of the future. Machines that kill us um, by themselves. But of course, it does raise important moral issues. Should we be building machines that go around autonomously killing people? And so there's all kinds of classic moral, moral problems. And we'll be looking at, at many of them. Now, when doing the moral stuff, one important thing to consider, of course, is, so how do we do our moral assessments? If we're going to talk about, like, this is good or this is bad, what do we use to sort that out? Well, here are some of the focuses of assessment. And these include actions. What's being done? Is the action itself good or bad? Consequences, you know, what arises from this is it good, are they good or bad? The character of the person doing it, what sort of person are they, virtuous or full of vice? And of course the motives, why are they doing what they're doing? Now interestingly, or boringly enough, when you go on to our adventures in part two, we'll see that people who develop moral theories tend to pick one of these to really focus on. For example, we'll talk about deontology and our good dead friend Immanuel Kant. He's an action guy. Not really an action hero, but he focuses on actions. Our good dead friend John Stuart Mill, he focuses on consequences. Our good dead friends um, Aristotle and Confucius are about character, about virtues, and also motives, that as well. So when we take something that occurred, has occurred, these are factors that we use to make moral assessments. What was done, is it good or bad? Are the consequences of those actions good or bad? What sort of character is involved? And why is, are they doing what they're doing? And as you notice, this also, not surprisingly, is analogous to the way law operates, at least supposedly. We look at what's done, what effect did it have, what kind of person is on trial, and why were they doing what they were doing. Now, interestingly or boringly enough, these things can all be, you know, kind of in the same mode. You can, like, all be good or all be bad. But there are often interesting cases in which it's kind of mixed and mashed, where you can get, in some ways, kind of odd combinations. For example, could there be a situation where someone has bad character, they're a bad person, they have evil motives, yet they do an action that seems, or actions that seem good, that have very good consequences. In other words, could someone do all the right things, an evil person do all the right things for all the wrong reasons? Oh. Here could be an example. 
Imagine, if you will, someone who's the CEO of evil corporation. They're evil, they're always hiring. They got good dental. And imagine the person is like seriously evil. Then among their, their many evil traits are they're sexist, they're racist, and they're greedy. And they got all kinds of sins, except for sloth. They haven't got that, because they're really they're a real go-getter. So no sloth. Just there are all the other stuff. So six of the deadly sins, but not the full seven. Now, so bad character, and their primary motive is greed. So they hate pretty much everyone else. What they love is that sweet, sweet cash. That's their number one goal, get cash. Now, suppose a person is running a company, and they're a total racist, sexist, awful, awful person, but motivated entirely by greed. Now, suppose someone runs a company, and they have all kinds of racist and sexist policies, and when they're interviewed, they say all kinds of racist and sexist things. So what would happen to Evil Corp if <laughs> their fearless leader did all that racist, sexist stuff, at least in the United States? Get shut down. Yeah, the super lawsuits, people say, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying from Evil Corp. I guess the Evil should have been a giveaway, but yeah, the company would fall apart, they would lose all their money, and they would be poor, the thing they hate the most. So in order to stay in business, of course, and get that cash to fill that greed, the person would need to have enlightened hiring policies. And of course, the consequence would be is the company would be hiring all kinds of people, you know, minorities, women, and doing things that would seem to be good. So out of pure greed, a very real person could do things that would seem to be good. Now, of course, you can also have other different combinations. For example, you can have people out of good character and good motives do something that has terrible consequences. For example, some many years ago, when they were developing the vaccine for polio, and polio is really bad. You don't, if someone offers you polio, do not accept it. <laughs> you do not want to do that. Polo shirts, probably okay. Game of polo, I guess okay. Never played it. Like horses, but you know, <laughs> I guess you have, you have a certain income to play the polo. <laughs> haven't got that income. I can play croquet, you know, the, the lawn thing. Bad at that. <laughs> Actually, we used to just hit each other with sticks. That was bad. So we're not allowed to play that anymore. So you could have, you know, when they were developing the polio vaccine, they were working out, you know, how to make it work. And the way, you know, vaccines to grow or simplify, there are some, some ways they work. But one way is they inject a totally dead virus, if death, you know, means anything for viruses. And what, so it's basically like they're injecting you with virus corpses. Well, kind of yucky. But anyways, so what happens is your immune system goes and grabs a hold and says, hmm, that stuff's pretty nasty. I'll remember that, so next time I see it, I'll be ready for it. Now, another thing they try is what are called attenuated viruses. They're weakened, so they kind of beat them up a bit, and then inject them. Now, unfortunately, what happens is sometimes the attenuated viruses are not totally beaten up. So when they were developing the vaccines, they actually did give some people polio. And that, of course, is bad. So good character, because only the doctors were good people. They wanted to you know, eliminate polio, but that particular thing had a bad consequence. Namely, people got polio. Another similar example was when they were developing um, you know, retrovirus treatments. Another interesting thing they do with viruses, normally we don't like viruses because they do bad stuff. But they found they can put stuff in viruses, genetic material, inject them, and they'll, they can fix you know, problems, you know, which is you know, not only ironic, but kind of funny, taking bad viruses, making them you know, work for us. But when they, one of the times, the first times they tried that, it had a, the result of killing the person they were trying it on. And that is clearly, you know, bad. So bad consequence, but good intentions and good motives to help people. And of course, you can also have people of good character who have bad motives, who do bad things. Because even good people have bad, bad days. They go, go bad. So those are three or four areas of, of assessment. Is the thing being done good or bad? What are the consequences, good or bad? What kind of person are we dealing with? And why are they doing what they're doing? 
Before pressing on, anything about the stuff so far that needs more stuff? <laughs> now, when assessing things, a good question is, how do we do our like assessing? What is our, you know, our point system, our currency? Well, it is value. Defined, um, you know, pretty pretty quickly, value is a measure of worth. Now, value can be in many areas. For example, the most obvious example is in economics. We talk about economic value, you know, money. There's also things like strategic value, you know, in military operations, you know, positions, etc., locations. There is artistic value. Our main concern, of course, is with moral value. But value, you know, put generically, is a measure of worth. Now, value, to add some more complexities to it, splits into, I guess, two main polarities. Positive value and negative value. Now, in the case of when we're talking about you know business and money, if you're running a business and you're getting positive value, you're making a yeah profit, it's a plus. And if you're not, you're running at a loss, which is bad. Unless you're looking for that tax write-off, which would be good because you can write off business expenses. Yeah. In fact, some you know there's some suspicion that um, Fantastic Four was created as a intentional flaw as a big tax runoff. The other explanation is that it's just really awful unintentionally. <laughs> I don't know which story is, is better. Now, when it comes to like art, we have you know, positive value is beautiful, sublime. Negative is awful, ugly. Now our main concern of course is with ethics. And stuff that is positive value and ethics we talk about as being Good. And the opposite is, of course, yeah, bad or evil. So we've got the positive and negative polarities. That's pretty straightforward. Now to make it more complicated, we have two more points of concern about value. Specifically, the intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Now one big big question, not only in ethics, but also in like art, economics, etc., is whether or not something has extrinsic value or intrinsic value. And so what's the difference? Intrinsic value is the easiest one. Something has in, has extrinsic value means that it is valuable because we value it. So its value derives externally. It has its value because we place value on it. Valuable because it is valued. Another way to look at it is stuff in the extrinsic value can also often be seen as means towards an end. They're valuable as a means to something else. So quick recap is basically extrinsic value means it's valuable because it is valued. The value comes externally. And Typically, it's regarded as a means to an end of something of greater value. It doesn't have value. Well, if it's purely extrinsic, it doesn't have value in and of itself. It's valuable because it's valued. Examples of this would be, well, I'll take um, easy and obvious examples. Things like uh, food. We value food because if we, we like the, the taste, typically. And if we don't get it, we die, basically. And so food is valid because we value it. If we, if we were like, you know, plants, we wouldn't value, you know, what's up with plant food? We wouldn't value food. If we just got all our, our nutrition from like, you know, all our nutrition from breathing and energy from the sun, yeah, we wouldn't have any use for, for food. And once, you know, Google killed us all, the, ro the robots take over, food won't be valuable because they won't need food. They just need energy. Another example is of extrinsic value 
would be uh, well things like cars. We value cars because well they go faster than we do. We carry more stuff, and we also sometimes value them because of their, they serve as status symbols and people you know enjoy them. You know people like driving driving around and stuff. Other examples of extrinsic value would be, well, a clear one is money. If you take out like a $10 bill, it's only valuable because we say it's valuable. That's why it's, that's the only reason why it's worth something. It's basically, um, well, actually money is a big game of make-believe, for real. <coughs> What's the difference between monopoly money and, and real money? Well, just, you know, one we call a game, and the other we pretend is real. It's only valuable because we value it. If someone didn't value money, it would have no value to them. So, you know, to use uh, kind of an extreme example, think of like, you know, the apocalypse movies and, you know, like walking, and shows like Walking Dead or Bad Bats. You know, after the apocalypse, money's not going to be worth, worth anything because, you know, there's no more currency in government. You can't buy stuff with it. And it's purely extrinsic value. It's only worth something because we say so. Interestingly, Things like uh, gold and diamonds. People often say, well, gold's got you know, real value. But really, no, it doesn't. Because gold is only valuable because we, we say so. Just like with money. You know, if someone takes all gold and says, I've got gold, well, it's only worth something if people are willing to trade that gold for something else. Now, I mean, true, generally gold has been held its value better than paper money. But that's just because we think it does. But it just, its value is just extrinsic. It's worth something because we say it, it is. So there's all kinds of stuff that's got extrinsic value. Uh, education, for example, does have extrinsic value because if you get a college education, on average you'll make, I think what they say is a million dollars more in your life than someone who doesn't have a college education. Now, that's a whole life. It's not like, you know, you don't get that million after you graduate. <laughs> It'd be kind of cool to get it up, you know, up front. I'll take my million now, please. <laughs> okay, I retire. I, I just want this. I just want life. Now, so this is pretty, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty well accepted. The stuff that's got value because we value it, or as a means to some other end. What's more controversial, though, is what's called intrinsic value. Intrinsic value, being very, you know, being very strict about it is something that has worth in and of itself. And in theory, even if there were no people or intelligent beings around to value it, it would still somehow have worth. So its worth does not depend on us valuing it. It's not valuable because we value it. We should value it because it is actually valuable. Its worth derives not from being a means to an end, but simply has value in and of itself. Now, that's a bit trickier because, again, extrinsic is easy. It's easy to prove something has extrinsic value. You just say, hey, would you like some of that? And someone says, yeah, it's got extrinsic value. Intrinsic is trickier, though. We need to find something or some things that have worth, regardless of how we think or feel about them, that don't depend on our value in them that is intrinsically worth, worth, worthy. What are some things people have put forth as, as contestants for this? Well, one is the, um, well, life. Is it a claim that life has intrinsic value? It's not a means to an end, it just has worth. We, won't, we typically want to see ourselves as having intrinsic value, that we are not things, we are not means, that we evaluate in, in ourselves. We are, we have worth. Some people take things like love to be have intrinsic value. That we don't want to be loved for our how good we look in a bathing suit, or what you know how sweet our car is, or how you know how many rooms our house has, or how big our bank account is. <clears throat> we just want to be loved because we are worthy of love. That's what we like. Now, as you might imagine, there's a lot of debate about this. There are many who claim there's no such thing as this. All value is extrinsic. All value depends on being a means to an end or being valued by you know, somebody. But there are those who do claim there's some intrinsic value. And the debate 
goes on. And when we get to part two, talking about moral theory, we'll see more of this. Okay, so that's our initial adventures in value. Before pressing on, anything about you know, plus or minus or extrinsic or intrinsic that needs more stuff. Now, when it comes to ethics, people often you know, go into ethics with sort of pre-established assumptions. In general, people generally tend to be like relativist or subjectivist, or they think they are. Because if you ask people like, well, you know, what's, what, what is morality? And people often say, well, you know, it's the rules of your you know, society or culture, or it's you know, what people think of being bad or, or not bad. Interestingly or boringly enough, there actually is a spectrum of morality. And a good question would be, so what does this mean? Why should one care? Well, here's what it means. Well, one, is, one of the important and meta-ethical questions is this. Is morality an aspect of reality? Or is it just you know, how we you know, feel about stuff? So kind of the question is, well, what is the foundation of morality? Is it something objective, you know, true or false, regardless of what we think about it, or is it something more subjective, you know, a matter of opinion or culture? Interestingly, boringly enough, every moral view, and any you know, moral view you might have, or anybody might have, fits somewhere in this spectrum, and it answers the question about morality being objective or subjective. Is it just, you know, not part of reality, or is it? To be a little clearer, we'll look at each of the options. At one extreme, we have what's called moral absolutism. How do you become a moral absolutist? Well, you've got to believe the following stuff. First, the moral absolutist believes that morality is objective. It's true or false, regardless of how we think or feel about it. Secondly, morality is absolute. That means that, first, there's only one correct answer to any moral problem. Secondly, and most importantly, there are no exceptions, hence the absolute part. For example, suppose someone's a moral absolutist and they believe that lying is wrong. Well, for the moral absolutist, lying would be objectively wrong, and it would always be wrong with no exceptions, no matter what. Lying would always, always be wrong. So you should never lie. Now, the appeal of absolutism is that it divides the world very sharply. You know, every, there's a definitive answer to every moral problem, and it's a sharp division. Absolute good, absolute evil, and of course, absolute vodka. That's not part of it. <laughs> now, suppose you, you like the objectivity. You think that, okay, morality is not just a matter of opinion. It's you know, a real, real thing. But you don't like the absolutism. To illustrate, let's go with the example of law. In general, do we think that generally lying is bad? Yes. Yeah, generally, especially when someone's lying to us. I think that's always, pretty much always bad. But are there exceptions? Are there times when lying is mm -hmm. probably okay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we think it's both bad and you know, also potentially not bad. Now, if you take that view, if you want to say, well, okay, it's bad, but there are exceptions, you could be an objectivist. The objectivist view is, is that morality is not surprisingly objective. It's true or false, regardless of what we think or feel about it. It describes you know, features of you know, reality correctly or incorrectly. But objectivism does allow for exceptions. So for example, taking lying, we generally think the lying you know, is, is bad. But we do allow cases where 
the lying is bad principle can be overridden. The usual example people use is, of course, lying to save people's lives. You, know, you can take like the usual historical example. You're, you know, a French farmer. You're hiding some Jewish people, you know, in your attic, and the Nazis show up and say, "Do you have any Jewish people?" And you say, "I do not. I do not have any Jewish people." It's lying, of course, but we'd say in that case, lying to protect people from Nazis is morally okay. Or you know, to use a you know non-historical example, suppose um, you have a friend is being subject to domestic violence, and they come over and you know, they they say they're beaten up and they they want you they want you to hide them, and then their partner comes over and says, "Where is that so and so?" And you say, "They're not here." It's a lie. But we would think that in general, to protect people from harm, we think that sort of lying is acceptable. Or similarly, when parents tell their kids about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny, sad, terrible lies. But we don't think of that as, as evil because the intent is a good one. So children believe that there is a Santa. And we totally wish Santa was real. Um, but we think that it's not as a bad, a bad lie. So you can be an objectivist and still accept, you know, morality is not just opinion, it's not just subjective, but exceptions are allowed. Our good dead friend John Stuart Mill is one of these people, and our good dead friend Emmanuel Kant, well, one of those guys. Now some people though say, well, I'm not really comfortable with morality being presented as objective. Things like, you know, density, mass, and volume, temperature, those are objective features of morality. If I wonder how much a table weighs, I can put it on scales. If I wonder what the temperature is, I can use you know, a thermometer. But when it comes to good and evil, how would I measure that? I can't take out my, you know, my smartphone and, have the, and you know, have the moral app that scan, you know, uses my camera and scans people for, for evil. Although that would be really handy. You scan people like, ooh, pretty evil. Better avoid that person. Or alternatively, I need to know the English of my evil army, sign this person up. <laughs> so what some people think is morality is not like an objective quality in the world, but they believe it's a matter of the culture. A matter of, you know, everyone's again has heard the expression when in Rome do as the Romans. It's a view that what is good or bad in Rome depends on the Romans. So in that case, if you believe morality is based on the culture, cultural rules, that view would be relativism. So how does relativism work? Well, I'll use my usual standard, standard crappy illustration by using an analogy to law. Now law, you know, human law, is clearly relative. What is legal or illegal depends on where you are. You know, it's hard. First, to use a simple example, suppose you've got uh, you know two uh, two states and a road running between them, and the speed limit here is 65, and it's 55 here, and the person's you know driving the car. Now, if they're driving here and they're going 65, perfectly legal, they're driving legally, but as soon as they cross the border, they're now driving illegally. Their speed stays at 65. Nothing about them or their car has changed, but now they're driving illegally because they're now in a different place. Or, you know, to use another example here, if the driving age here is, say, 18, and the driving age in this place is 21, then suddenly they're driving illegally. So it all depends on where you, where you are. And even in the United States, it, you know, it can depend on what county you're in, what city, what state. Which is why it's always good to check the local laws, because they do vary a great deal. Something you can legally, you know, have in your car be walking around with in one state could be like a 10-year sentence in another state. It's always good to check. I mean, for example, in Texas, you might have seen pictures of people walking around, you know, carrying assault rifles, going to like, you know, Wendy, you know Wendy's and stuff. They have open carry. But if you walked around, you know, if you went into a Wendy's and assault rifle in you know, Florida, it probably wouldn't go quite as, quite as well. 
Now, so how does relativism work? Well, the idea there is, using the analogy of law, is that just as law is set by where you are, morality is set by where you are, by the culture. So imagine we've got two cultures, culture A and culture B. And suppose B embraces you know, principles of gender equality, that women and men have this, you know, the same basic rights, right? The drive, education, et cetera. And in country A, things are a bit different. Women are considered to be inferior, and they're not allowed, they regard the woman driving as being immoral. So if there's a woman driving a car in country B, she's driving morally. But as soon as she crosses over into A, nothing about her or her car has changed, but because the culture regards that as wrong, she is now acting wrongly. So the culture determines the morality, the cultural rules. And as we'll see when we get to part two, this idea of moral relativism, pretty popular. A good example of moral relativism is our good, really, really, really dead friend, Herodotus. And he's super dead because he was an ancient Greek, so he's not only dead, he's super dead. <laughs> now, for some people, though, relativism is not enough. They look at it and say, well, yeah, that's all well and good, you know, culture sets the morality. But that's kind of repressive. Why can't the individual decide what's good or bad? And also looking at it, when we look at cultures, we don't see uniformity in the culture. For example, if we were to ask, what does American culture say about capital punishment? Or open carry of firearms? And the answer would be, well, it depends on who you ask. Some will think it's OK. Some will think that it's wrong. So what some people do is they embrace subjectivism. What subjectivism? Well, I need another crappy analogy for that. Now, some things are pretty clearly subjective. Take, for example, food. Whether you like or dislike a certain thing is subjective. So if someone says plantains are yucky, and someone says plantains are yummy, they're expressing a subjective view. Plantains are neither, they, if you were to analyze plantains, you would find, you know, carbohydrates and sugars and so forth, but you wouldn't find yumminess or yuckiness. Those aren't things <laughs> in plantains. So how we, you know, feel about them is subjective. It's what it tastes like to you. The subjectivist about ethics takes to me that morality works the same way. So good or bad, is how you feel about things. So if you like, for example, capital punishment, subjectively it would be good for you. If you dislike it, if your view is capital punishment, yuck, it would be subjectively bad to you. Now one problem with subjectivism, of course, is everybody has different views, and some people claim that if you buy a subjectivism, you really can't stick to it because at all, effectively, there is no morality. Going with our law analogy, what if you can make up your own law, just whenever you felt like it? Would there be any law anymore? No, it'd be meaningless. You just make up your own rules at every, every point. Rules would, you know, have no meaning anymore. Now, this takes us to our last two. Moral nihilism. Suppose, looking at this, a person says, well, when people are talking about morality, they're really talking about nothing. Moral nihilism is that view. It's a view that when people talk about good and evil, right and wrong, they're talking about nothing. The words refer to nothing. So what's this like? Well, surprise, surprise, I have yet another crappy analogy. Now, the moral nihilist is to morality what the atheist is to religion. The moral nihilist does not deny that people talk about good and bad, right and wrong. The moral nihilist does not deny that there are books on ethics, just like someone who's an atheist. They don't deny that there are churches, synagogues, and mosques. Atheists don't deny that people talk about God and you know, angels and saints and stuff. What, it, what an atheist claims is, when people are talking about God and angels and saints, they're talking about nothing. There's no such things. So a moral nihilist is, moral nihilism is a view that morality is about nothing. It's all make-believe. There is 
nothing to it. And our last one is moral skepticism. That's the view that you can't know about morality, good or bad, right or wrong. So we go from one extreme to the other. There's one true view, no exceptions. There's true and false, there are exceptions. It all depends on your culture. When you're Rome, the Romans are right. It's subjective. It's all about what you like and what you dislike. It's talking about nothing. And I have no idea. I don't know. And so that covers up pretty much all the options. So next time, in our next exciting adventure in ethics, we'll press on to more stuff with ethics. Thank you.